Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to look at Reentry and Orbital Simulator. This is a game uh, that's just turned up on Steam kind of by surprise. And so far it offers simulations of the Mercury, Gemini and Apollo spacecraft. Yes, Reentry and Orbital Simulator with odd font choices. This is early access. It's actually quite cheap. It's under like $20 right now. Uh, now, it's kind of a, it's basically cockpit oriented. It's not a true simulator as far as I can see. It doesn't go like way off into the deep end like, um, you know, Orbiter. But uh, it is kind of fun to play around. So yeah, we have all these various missions here from various spacecraft. Gemini, Apollo, and uh, yeah, like what, what we were going to look for here. GT-3, the Molly Brown. GT-3 was the first manned mission in the Pop Man NASA's Gemini program, the second American manned space program. 1965, Gus Grissom, John Young, flying around the Earth, launched by a Titan rocket. Okay, here we are in the Gemini in uh, Florida. Look at that, that's beautiful. I wonder how far I can zoom out. Not very far. This is the real deal. Prepare the cockpit and get ready for launch. Roger. All right, 10 minutes. Let's do the final setup. Follow the checklist on the cockpit. Setting OBC, MDIU. Computer is up and running. Let's go through the preparation routine. So, uh, checklists, pre-flight. Computer is ready, set to ascent when you need to, Scott. Roger. So I'm gonna run this. Main battery up. Oh, okay, so we get a bunch of things on this panel here. So click, click, main batteries these are. And then squib batteries need to be set to on. Oh, these need to be flipped twice. Cunning. And then the fuel cells are here, so we're gonna flip these on. Listen to the super dramatic music. Fuel cell two, A, B, and C. Section one, or fuel cell one, power up. Fuel cell two, power up. Squib, boost, insert up. Okay, now we're over on the other side again. Squib th Retro, Squib Retro 3, Squib Retro 4, or Squib Retro 4. Cool Prime Pump. Okay, prime the pump. Prime the pump. And then Pump A. Secondary Pump. Pump, oh, Primary and Secondary, there we go. Suit Fan should be down. Computer Mode 1. Okay, let's do that. And we're switching it to Ascent mode here. So you can zoom in and, of course, look at all these panel switches. They certainly seem to do the right thing here. I'm not sure how much of this is simulated in the back end at this point. Now, to be clear, I'm not sure how much of this stuff is actually simulated on the back end and how much is more or less window dressing to a back end scripting system. But it is nice to see most of the switches you would expect in the cockpit to be in roughly the right place and looking like roughly the right things. The Gemini cockpit is obviously kind of hard to do because it's designed for two crew with different controls on each side. So you have to shift the camera from one side of the cockpit to the other. But yeah, look at the exterior. That's a pretty good rendition of the Gemini sitting on top of the Titan. And for everyone that asks, yes, apparently NASA said Gemini, despite the fact that everyone else thinks it's Gemini. So I'm just going with a NASA pronunciation for this particular program, since it's their particular rocket. It was, of course, launched on top of a Titan missile, and it didn't have an escape system. It had uh, ejector seats instead. Okay, let's just skip forward to the launch. Ten, nine, Here we go, eight, let's go to the exterior. Oh, let's stay on the exterior. Four, three, two, one. Ignition. ignition! Oh. We have ignition, capsule one is good to go. Bolts and lift off, get ready for roll and pitch program. I'm gonna say I do like the fact that I could hear the, the whoop sound as the engine spooled up. Uh, you know, the most rocket engines, of course, they have turbo pumps that are powered by the fuel flowing and combusting through them. But to get them started, the Titan had a little solid rocket motor which would f uh, burn through the system and get everything up to speed. You are on your way. Yeah, man! Now, the game for launch, it only renders a very small part of the landscape. Uh, look, I think it must be a plane. It, you can see the edges here, and then it's tiled the textures out. Some of those launch sites didn't exist when Gemini existed, but when you get high enough, it forces you to switch to a different viewpoint. 
You just hide the fact that it's switching coordinate systems. Anyway, we should probably like skip ahead in the launch because you can't really accelerate time. CC one plus forty. Roger DCS. We're gonna set the first DCS update with a verification of orbital parameters. We see it, young. Please verify memory address fifty six and fifty seven. That's the guidance computer, I guess. Yeah, you mean, I, I don't know like a huge amount about the guidance computer in the, the Gemini, but I do know that it had something like 4K of memory, but there were 39-bit memory, like words in memory, which is bizarre. And it, it ran, I think, about the, the, like 7 kilohertz, which is something ridiculous. But hey, <laughs> you know, that was cutting edge. They managed to shrink that down into 27 kilograms of hardware. Yeah, I should really figure out if I can run Tetris or something on it. Anyway, you know, all I need to know here is it has guided us towards orbit. Yep, there's the staging, and I can just about see the Earth, the edge of the Earth, through the tiny, tiny window in the Gemini spacecraft. Let's uh, go to the exterior view. Yep, there it is, the second stage is firing. Now, one thing I have observed is that the game doesn't model physics for the discarded stages so that despite the fact that I'm accelerating at like about 1g these things are more or less following me along into orbit just slowly drifting backwards so just ignore that well uh, <laughs> that's just how it is it is early access so it's entirely possible that it actually gets proper you know behavior for discarded stages which will be of course important for Gemini 4. Yep, skipping forward two minutes and you can still see that booster just floating out there, not wanting to fall back to Earth. It's being dragged along by my gravitational mass, I imagine. That's what's going on here. We are connected by a bond that cannot be broken. However, we have, we have reached orbit. Second uh, stage engine key uh, cut off. And so now we need to perform separation, and that isn't actually a, an automated system. If you look around, there's a ton of controls, and there's one up here that's lit up. Separate spacecraft. There we go. Okay, we are separated. So I can, uh, let me just take a look. Roger, it's LVA, whatever. It's just a lot of that stuff comes from the actual mission that was flown. There we go. So now we've separated to that upper stage. And if this was Gemini 4, we could turn around and try to rendezvous with it and then realize that we don't understand orbital mechanics. And now we're safely in orbit, we need to uh, find the control to jettison the fairing. That's us there. So not all of these things actually seem to be scripted correctly, so I'm, I'm doing it whatever way I know how. I honestly haven't seen a decent Gemini simulator in Orbiter. Orbiter, uh, if you don't know, is this free space simulator. Orbiter 2016 is the latest version, and it is absolutely fantastic, right down to things like the module or the mod for it that does Apollo actually runs the guidance computer code inside an emulator. However, it's not trivial to get Orbiter and everything running. You're probably going to spend forever trying to you know, tune it and get mods and everything you need. This, literally, you download from Steam, it costs 20 bucks and it just works. And sure, it has plenty of issues, but it is early access. So I'm, I'm really, I have no problem recommending this at this time. I'm hoping that we get to see some more spacecraft and we get to see some more scripted missions. There's a bunch of like training things in the game, training missions, documents, all that stuff designed to like give you a clue on how to fly the spacecraft. And there's also missions which are based on the real historical missions and also simpler missions which are just designed to give you an idea for how the spacecraft would complete a few orbits. Another thing you might buy, you might want to look at if you like Mercury is uh, Mercury Go for Launch, which is really a simulator that's focused around the VR experience. So you can sit in the Mercury cockpit and you can flip all the switches and fly a couple of missions. Now, right now, the development seems to have slowed a bit. The last update was in June and he did make a you know, comment, some postings in September, but it is, you know, pretty solid experience. 
It obviously doesn't cover the other rockets that this covers, but you know, it has its upsides, especially if you have a VR system and you want things to look cool and appreciate what a sunset or sunrise or sunset looks like from orbit. Anyway, yeah, let's take a look at some of the other vehicles. So yeah, the, one of the interesting things I have found out is you can uh, just push this button here to open the hatch and destroy the Gemini spacecraft. That is not accurate, but I'm not going to knock any points off for that. So yeah, obviously the Saturn V is by far the most complicated vehicle that's simulated right now, but the simulation is only... It's only partial. For a start, you can't fly it out to the moon. They don't have translunar injection and all that figured out. But look, it does have the familiar launch assembly, that launch pad. You have the mobile launch platform, and you have a pretty comprehensive interior. There are a lot of controls, way more than in the Gemini capsule. And uh, yeah, the most important ones, well, obviously we've got all our boosters, or all our uh, fuses, fuses, that's the word. Yeah, we get like useful sheet sheets there for learning how to navigate and yeah moving around it's kind of glitchy but the one that I really want to show you is the Apollo guidance computer which obviously I know a little about <laughs> I've learned a bit about this recently so this is me just starting it up so I'm telling it to run program number one and you see on the left it's basically aligning the inertial uh, inertial navigation platform there it is and that's us getting ready and it switches over to program two you'll see now again I'm pretty sure this isn't running actual AGC code if you want that there is something called NASSP for uh, Orbiter 2016 which is is free but it is kind of complicated to set up but hey the models on this look pretty nice very 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 shiny Apollo I don't think I've ever seen a, an Apollo this shiny. Also, Capsule 1 is not the name of any Apollo mission, as far as I know. This is like part of the translation and docking routine, so you or tutorial, so you can learn how to fly it. I'm not going to show you that because I've done it like a million times in Kerbal Space Program. Meanwhile, since we're talking about shiny rocket models, we obviously have to take a look at the Mercury Atlas. The Atlas tanks were made of very thin stainless steel. They were balloon tanks, which meant that they required internal pressurization to maintain their rigidity. Unfortunately, they, this game seems to be causing all sorts of interesting problems with my uh, video capture. So there's a bit of screen tearing going on. I will try and fix that the best, uh, best I can. Yeah, I, of course, if you remember, I built or I drew one of these at full scale a few weeks ago in the parking lot of the Chabot Space Science Center. It's still there, although it's kind of starting to fall apart a bit. <laughs> and actually, I think today's rainstorms will finally put the end to my, uh, to my magnificent paper tape drawing of the Atlas. Anyway, yeah, look, we have the full interior. Okay, well, why is the moon in front of the clouds there? You know, some sort of flat earther will see that and jump to the wrong conclusion. But yeah, we have the full interior. We have uh, checklists for all of these things that I can run through if I want to. There is a sequencer there. That is, um, that's the launch computer, basically. It's not a computer, it's a sequencer. It does these various events, starting with jettisoning the tower, then staging, then, uh, you know, firing the booster packs at the right time. Over there, that's my environmental controls. The Mercury was a vastly simpler spacecraft than the Gemini and the Apollo. It's really fascinating to watch how the technology changes from one to the other. So yeah, this is re-entry and orbital simulator. The developer is actively developing it. He's talking about adding a bunch of other spacecraft. He's made it clear it's not a hardcore simulation. If you want that, go to Orbiter 2016 that has practically everything you will ever need but it is nice plug in and play and it just works if you want to be flicking space air yeah, switches inside spaceship cockpits this is a pretty good option for you and you know for like space nerds that want a more casual experience it actually is pretty good because all the tutorials and stuff seem to be scripted in game so you can sit there and more or less follow it step by step 
and get an idea of what it took to fly these things. There's a little bit of information during the uh, flight that gives you explanations for why you had to flick these switches, which is you know a great thing to know because sometimes uh, you know sometimes these information this information is hard to find. So yeah, it's in the Steam store. It's like less than twenty bucks. Check it out. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.